with infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. So back with me for another episode, and this will be part one of two for book six, is story collector and author John Olson. And on this episode, we will cover a few sightings and encounters from his brand new released book, Stranger Paranormal, which is book six in the Stranger Bridgerland book series. And like I said, we will likely be executing a uh, second episode covering this very same book. So again, that is available right now. Go get it. We are covering a tiny, tiny portion of what John has collected in this book, Stranger Paranormal. Well, John, welcome back. And, you know, before we get to a few of the stories shared with you for Stranger Paranormal, I would like to begin with what you opened the book with. And that is a couple of recent experiences that you and your wife, Annie, have had and these actually occurred in a home that we've covered quite a bit on our prior visits right yeah exactly yeah it's it's the house i grew up in and the one that got me started in all of this paranormal uh, experience and collecting and uh, there for a while for about two years or so um we were living right there um you know on the same property with my parents because they were having some health issues and we were trying to help them out. And so we spent a lot of time in that house. And we had quite a few experiences while we were there, uh, Annie and I. One uh, that I talk, the two, there's two that I talk about in the book. First of all, um, Annie was over talking and, and helping my parents. And at the time, our two cats uh, were living in the house. And they'd taken over the upstairs because my mom's a little shih tzu. It doesn't like cats, so he would chase them out of the out of the main floor where my parents live to the upstairs. So they decided they were just going to take the upstairs. So my wife had gone, was headed up the stairs to check on the cats, and some movement caught her eye. And this is the same staircase that I talk about with the heavy footsteps and everything that go on quite a bit on it. And at the top of the stairs, she noticed she noticed a hand that was around the corner against the wall. And she stopped and looked, and it was an old man's hand, kind of skinny, with a white button-down shirt. And it just, as she noticed it, it just kind of slid back around the corner and into the room. And she kind of stopped for a minute and was trying to figure out what was going on. And so she went upstairs and looked in the rooms and everything, and there was nobody around. Nobody was there whatsoever. And... uh so she just, of course, chalked that up to the the ghost being up there, and I, be, I believe that was the 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 gentleman that we've talked about, the man with the wide brimmed hat, um, with the white button down shirt and overalls that I had seen quite a few times growing up in the house, and so that was kind of a scary experience that Annie had up there. Another one that she had real quick that I actually didn't put in the book. Uh, for a while, her office was up there. Um, she, she works from home, and that was the best place to get the internet and everything plugged in. So she turned my old bedroom that I'd had up there into an office, and she was working, sitting at the desk working, and all of a sudden she heard heavy boot steps running from one side of the house towards her and then ran into the room that she was and across the room and stopped. And And she's just kind of in shock for a minute. And she thought, well, did I imagine it? And she looked down at her cat, Loki, who always 
is with her in the office and Loki was standing there all the hair on her on her back was standing on end and her tail was all puffed up and she was staring at the corner of the room and Annie decided that she hadn't imagined it it had really happened because the cat had seen it as well so she kind of went downstairs to have a break and have some lunch and let everything calm down upstairs so really a lot of activity upstairs that was going on uh, off and on I I had the interesting experience. I was cleaning up the basement. I decided, uh, you know, after years of neglect, I was going to make, you know, a couple piles. One that we would just get rid of, one that was going to go to donation, and then one that if anybody wanted stuff from. So I was in the basement cleaning, and, you know, the, the ghost doesn't like change. When things start changing, it kind of gets active. And I'd started making the piles and I walked into the room, another room in the basement to kind of assess what was next. And all of a sudden I got a a bop right on the top of my head and I'm all alone in the basement. And I turn and look up and above it's kind of a shorter room, but above is where we store all of our fishing poles up in there. And at least our old fishing poles. And one of the poles was still wiggling Um, It had come down and bashed me on the head and then slid back into place. And then I realized, oh, you know, it it must be the ghost that's upset because I'm moving a lot of things. I'm changing. I'm even throwing away some things. And I said, you know, I said, this place, I said out loud, I said, this place has got to be cleaned up. You know, you got to calm down. I know it's not fun, but it's got to be cleaned up. And I went back to work, moving things around again. And then I stopped once again to look and kind of assess what's next to work on. And it was was at that point, I got a shove in the back enough that I, you know, kind of stumbled forward a little bit. Not, you know, kind of a, why aren't you paying attention? I, you know, I didn't want you to do this kind of a thing. And so I kind of caught my balance and turned around. Of course, you know, I'm alone in the basement. And so I said, in in an even firmer voice, I was like, look, this place has got to be cleaned up. And so uh, you're gonna, I'm going to go have lunch. You take about an hour to get used to the idea of this change, and then I'll be back. And so I went and had lunch and came back and, and didn't have any more problems the rest of that day, but um, still very interesting and kind of you know physical contact for sure uh, that the ghosts were not happy that things were changing in the house. I love how you gave the spirit a chance to let it accept the fact that this is going to happen. Just let that sink in. I'll be back. Right. Right. Exactly. And it's funny when I tell people that story, they're like, are you crazy? You weren't scared to death. And I was like, well, no, not really. I know what's there. I know, you know, the content of it. I lived my life growing up in this house. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't really frighten me any more than, you know, somebody living there that would be mad at me that I was changing things. But yeah, it's, it's definitely kind of exciting though. And kind of cool experience, I guess you could say. I mean, they have a point though, you know, I think a lot of people that have not had the experiences that you guys have had, especially you growing up in that house and having these things go on for years to be there and, and kind of have this in your face all of a sudden, let alone touching you uh, and having that interaction, which doesn't, that, that is a rarity, I think, amongst the the whole paranormal world for the most part is actually physical interaction, you know? So I think anybody that wouldn't be used to that may have handled that a little bit differently, just ran screaming out from the basement. I don't know. Right. (laughs) And I can understand that for sure. Um, in my years of growing up there, I've seen things move. I've had things thrown at me. I, you know, I, I, I don't think I was the favorite of the ghosts. I don't know exactly how to put that, but yeah, it's, it's just interesting. One of those things where I'm kind of like, you know, putting my foot down and saying, you know, it's got to happen. I'm not going to stop. So let's all come to terms with it. But I can definitely see from everybody else's standpoint, because they kind of look at me in disbelief. Many people, (laughs) they're like, you just stood there. I'm like, well, yeah, I did. I tell people all the time that, you know, when it comes to at least the ghosts that I grew up with, I'm not afraid of ghosts. It's, it's real people that scare me. But 
they seem more capable of, of horrible things to me, but yeah. it's definitely an interesting situation. You are spot on with that, 100%. And, you know, with with that second experience that you shared about Annie is the fact that, you know, you can try to convince yourself that it was nothing or, you know, you didn't hear it or it was just something else that you misidentified. But once the cat, once Loki's hair is standing on end, you can't really dismiss that as easily. Yeah, exactly. The cat... The cat knew exactly what had happened to, and and I think that solidified. Nope, I I heard what I actually heard, and so and she's a little, you know, not growing up in the house, you know, she's definitely a little bit more afraid when something like that happens, which I can completely understand. But she had to go out and go get some lunch and get away for a while. But you know, as when she came, she's mentioned when she came back, the cat was calmed down, so she knew it was kind of back to normal and felt good about getting back to work. But <laughs> Well, this first one that I went to, you probably guessed this, that it may have been in the first round that I picked anyway, right? But this one, we're going to head up north a little ways to Minnesota, and this one is Fall Lake Sasquatch. Oh, and you know what, John? Before we get there, I always like to ask you this because, you know, I'm a story collector as well, and it's always fascinating to, to hear where where do you normally get these stories from at this point? Now that you've been doing this for several years and you're even more well-known than when you started out, are these more through email? Is it still word of mouth, friends of friends? Where Or, or is it just running the gamut still? It, it's still, it kind of runs the gamut because, like, uh, for example, today, um, I was in town and I ran into a friend that I knew and they're like, oh, I know your your new book came out. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, you got to talk to this friend of mine. She lives in a haunted house. You know, here's her contact information. And and so I get some stuff like that, which is how I got, you know, my original stories. But a lot of the ones, especially that are further away, like this one in Minnesota, these people have a lot of them either found my books and and read them and find my email at the back and they're like oh i have you know i'd love to tell you my story or they hear me on you know story you know shows like yours and then they contact me through my email and so it kind of varies but you know the ones that are getting further and further away obviously they're they're either hearing me on a um a, a show like yours or they're reading my books or finding me that way and, and contacting me, which is great too, because, you know, there's, it seems like every area has its own paranormal and kind of its own paranormal feel as well. Like for example, Minnesota, you, this is a, a Sasquatch story, but I know there's, you know, people uh, who see all kinds of things uh, in the woods out there, like um, the dog men story is big in Minnesota as well. And, so it's it's great to get out and, and away from the area that I live to collect stories as well, to hear from people from all over the country and even into Canada and, and every once in a while Mexico. So, Yeah, you definitely have them all over. And we, we do have one coming up for this edition that's kind of the Utah-Nevada border. And, you know, mm -hmm. for, for me, because of the fact that my own experience was in Utah – um, uh, it, I'm partial to that, but I, of course, like you love to hear from places you've never been. Maybe you'd like to go one day. And, uh, this one definitely fell into that category. Yeah, it did. Um, Tyler, Tyler contacted me, um, after, um, after hearing me on a show and he had a great story. This was really a great story. I think this was one of my first One's from Minnesota. Um, I'm trying to remember. There's so many stories. I Sometimes they get, you know, kind of me trying to remember where all of them are from. But yeah, so he, he contacted me and had this great story. Uh, the summer before his senior year of high school, uh, him and his buddies liked to go and travel around. And they decided they wanted to go camping and out. And it was the, near the end of July. And one of their friends owned a cabin. Uh, out near Fall Lake, which is in northern Minnesota. And so they all got together. There's four of them. They, you know, drove up to the cabin and um, got there late the first night on Thursday and all went to bed. Uh, his buddy that owned the cabin took the, um, the only bed and everybody else kind of crashed all over, you know, on the couches and, and around. And Tyler said he woke up in the middle of the night and he wasn't sure what time it was. 
and he could hear something going around the cabin and kind of tapping and and feeling around the outside of the cabin and kind of looking in the garbage cans and then it 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 went away and he sat there for a little while and it was really quiet and he finally fell back to sleep and he got up the next morning and they ate breakfast and went and did you know fun things around the lake and fishing and you know just were having a great time and he mentioned to his friend that he'd heard that and his friend that owned the cabin said well we've got raccoons and every once in a while we have a bear that comes around it was probably one of those that you heard, you know, out there and going through the garbage or something. And so he kind of brushed it off and they went through the day and just enjoyed the day. And later on, it was midnight before they finally got back and, and fell asleep. And again, just crashing everywhere in the cabin. About 3 a.m., Tyler wakes up and he can hear something. He can hear the garbage cans moving, which is right off the back of um, the kitchen. And he tries to wake up one of the, his other friends. And he just can't get anybody to steer, to stir with him. So he's listening and he's like, well, it's probably a raccoon or the bear. And so he's like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go scare, scare it and scare him away. So he gets the flashlight and goes to the back door. He swings the back door open with the light on and, and he yells, you know, who's out there? What's going on? And he freezes and this creature freezes. He realizes this is not a raccoon. This is not a bear. There is an eight foot tall, large, hairy creature going through the garbage. It has part of the garbage in its hand. It's, it has the face similar to a man. It, you know, puts, when it puts his hand up to shield its eyes from the light, because Tyler's shining the light right on it, he can see a mouth a big mouth just full of teeth, you know, bright white teeth. So Tyler screams and this thing gives out a gruddle, just a a guttural, you know, grunt and then, and turns and he drops the flashlight, stumbles back through the kitchen, slams the door and is just laying there screaming, wakes everybody up in the, in the place. And they come in and, one of his buddies, you know, opens the door to get the the flashlight and Tyler's yelling at him, it's a monster, don't open the door. And he opens it and, you know, gets the flashlight. The garbage is, you know, messed up, but there's nothing out there. And they come in and talk to him and they're like, well, what was it? You know, the, and he's like, I think it was a Bigfoot. I think it was a, you know, a Sasquatch. So everybody listens to him and then everybody else goes back to bed and he just sits up all night with the flashlight. He's scared to death that this thing's going to come back. But uh, the next day, you know, he was, you know, he said that through the rest of the trip and everything, he just wouldn't leave anybody like to go anywhere. He had to have somebody with him because he was just kind of in shock. And one of his friends finally confided in him that his dad had told him that uh, years ago in the same similar area had run into a Sasquatch while he was deer hunting. And so, you know, and Tyler's like, yeah, you know, I, I saw a Sasquatch. That's what it was. And even though, he, you know, he talked about it was a really short, you know, encounter really quick with him flashing the light and screaming and the thing, you know, wasn't very long, but he said it just was one of those things that sticks in the back of your mind that never leaves you. You know, for a long time, he closed his eyes and he could still see this thing. Um, He had great detail talking about how it was uh, brown and blondish hair inside, you know, the the coat and the face looking very much like a a human's face and the teeth being just huge when it opened its mouth. And so it was really kind of a cool story and it was great to talk to him and, and get this story from him. And of course, you know, Minnesota has a lot of Bigfoot. Uh, sightings up there as well so just a great story yeah i love that one especially the stories that the the sass is coming in really close to the cabin or the house whatever it is and he's got this kind of tapping and this, you can feel that the, the sasquatch is just making its way around the cabin but it is a bummer that and you hear this a lot that he felt like his friends really didn't believe him but then at least one of the right. dads was like well actually I know that they're out there, so don't worry. You're you're not alone. 
Right, exactly. And, you know, it, it reminded me of another story that I had gotten. And there's not, I mean, I talked to the person and there wasn't much story because they didn't see the Sasquatch. But this was here in, in northern Utah. They own a cabin and they had had something breaking into their garbage. And they thought, oh, it's a bear. So they bought a bear proof garbage can, got it out there, and it's rated for grizzlies. And they had it for about a week and something physically ripped the top of it off to get to the food. And they said something that's rated for a grizzly, they have no idea, you know, what would have the strength to rip the top of this garbage can off to get to the food. And I said, well, I I know what has that strength. And they said, well, we never saw any tracks, but we just can't figure out what it would be. And I said, I'm pretty sure I know what it was, but. You know, and they kind of look at me funny because they don't believe in Sasquatch. But I'm like, something ripped the top of your garbage can off that was rated for grizzlies. So you tell me what it was. Time to get the Bigfoot rated garbage can, you know? Yeah, exactly. Time, time exactly. to graduate so. up. Yeah, yeah. I can see you doing <laughs> that. You're like, um, I have an idea of what did this <laughs> with no problem. Yeah. yeah. When you're talking about something like at yeah. least eight feet tall, like, uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I actually looked. Yep. Because I wasn't familiar with Fall Lake, Minnesota, so I just I just did a mm-hmm. quick look, see, and back in 2000, because I was wondering, well, I wonder how rural it is, and I wonder how often that his particular his friend's cabin was occupied. Because a lot of times they're you know for summertime use, and nobody wants to get yeah, stuck up there in winter. Use, I get yeah. that, but in 2000 there was 584 people, and in 2020. There's still only 750 people a couple of years ago for 462 square miles. So yeah, that is really very, wilderness. very, very rural. Yeah. So I can imagine a, a biggie just loving it, especially July, perfect weather, and not a ton of people around in that area. Right. right exactly. Yep. It, it's kind of like perfect you know scenario up there with with sasquatch and like you say it's just so rural up there and i believe when i looked at it too it's not too far you know you're not too far from canada which goes straight into more wilderness and more you know just vast stretches of nothing so yeah yeah they have a long way to go for a lot of miles well next up is the one that i was mentioning from the utah nevada border and i personally love because i think i'm terrified of it dark spaces caves mines Mm -hmm. anything subterranean or you know just built into the wall of whatever a la a mine Uh, that is what this is and this is titled the mine of nightmares and ken shared this with you yeah, he did. And Ken contacted me several years ago. I've been trying to get this one into the books and and, and move it in because I just it's just it's actually one of my favorite stories. So back in the early uh, 80s, Ken, when Ken was around 20 years old, he had a buddy named Andrew and they just love to explore, especially in the West Desert, just, you know, all the way around kind of hiking and exploring. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the West Desert as well. And I know that you can come across mines out there that aren't on the map and some that are on the map and there's folklore, you know, just, it's just kind of a crazy place out there. So Andrew found this mine um, out there. And then when he was exploring and he talked to Ken and so they decided they were going to take a trip out there. And so uh, Ken lived in Salt Lake. He still does live um, outside of Salt Lake now, but they got ready, went early you know, hiked out to the mine and, you know, started exploring like they do. He he talks a lot. He told me a lot about, you know, when you when you're doing this, it's not, you know, you got to be really careful when you're in the mines because the miners have left a lot of stuff. He's found, you know, over the times he's done it, he's found, you know, dynamite that they left and just all kinds of things, which can be super scary and super dangerous. And so he he wanted to make sure when I was talking to him that he I put that disclaimer out there that not everybody should go wandering in a mine they find. But him and Andrew were in this mine and they had been going for quite a while. And um, all of a sudden, you know, they're talking, trying to figure out what they're going to do. And Ken's like, hey, can you hear that? You know, and they stop and listen and they can hear some weird chattering coming from down uh, one of the tunnels. 
they're just listening. And so they start walking that way. You know, the closer they get, they realize that the chattering is it's it's a weird whistle chatter talk that it almost sounds like there's two individuals talking with this. They get down almost to where it's coming from. Andrew yells out, you know, hey, is somebody there? It stops and then they can hear, you know, running down the tunnel. And so they try and get around to where they can see and they they don't see anything. And and so they're like, well, that was really weird. You know, what what the crap could that be? And they're sitting there talking for a few minutes. And all of a sudden he notices that Andrew's just, you know, wide eyed and staring down behind him towards the tunnel. And so he turn, you know, Ken turns to look and see what he's looking at down around the next bend there is this thing that's leaning out and looking at them from the other tunnel, from the side tunnel. He, it was kind of a green, blackish, scaly kind of thing um, with a really, it was a big head like his, but it looked very, like I said, lizardy. And its eyes were sh- shining with the, the lamp, like some animals' eyes do. They, the, you know, they both obviously freaked out, took off out of there. Andrew, you know, got way ahead of him. And when he finally caught Andrew outside of the, outside of the mine, they finally got out. They were talking and Andrew said that while they were talking, it would, it was started to bob its head around the corner to look at him with kind of a bobbing motion. Andrew had gotten a better look at it, I guess. It was very like a large lizard type person (laughs) that was staring at them from there. So, you know, they obviously didn't go back in there. They talked about it for at lengths about what they had seen. And when, after I, you know, when I was interviewing him and everything, I explained to Ken that, you know, there's actually a large number of folklore stories about, you know, the West Desert and Nevada and these lizard creatures. And sometimes they're associated with UFOs and sometimes they're often uh, associated with with mines or tunnels out there that there's even been stories of group of lizard men that live both under LA and Salt Lake City there's um uh, stories of of people running into the these creatures underneath Salt Lake and under LA and he he didn't realize that there'd been that many stories about these lizards that, you know he hadn't told a lot of people because you know how do you explain that you saw a lizard man out in the desert it's kind of a strange thing for sure. So I kind of reassured him that he wasn't alone with seeing these uh, this lizard man and out there. But it, it, I, I really like the story. He was very genuine, um, very down to earth guy, and you know I could just tell through his whole story that it was a very shocking thing for them for it to happen to him. I mean, lizard people under under L.A. sounds just kind of fitting, doesn't it? Sorry, sorry, LA. Just kidding. Um, but <laughs> the lizard people under LA. Um, the lizard people. Yeah. Does did Ken mention anything about you know? D- does he and and his buddy ever go into mines or caves anymore, or did that kind of uh, solve that issue of driving out to remote areas and and trying to go spelunking in these places? Um, they still did exploring. They still did that. But he tried a couple times to go into mines that they found, and he just it, he wouldn't. It, he'd go back a little ways, he said, and then it was just all those old feelings would come back, and he finally gave up on any kind of spelunking or going underground just because of that. Yeah. You know, he still loved to explore and 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 check out. You know, these um, ghost towns and stuff. But he said, yeah, it just. I just never felt comfortable going back underground after that. Mm. And I said, I cannot totally understand that. For cannot sure. blame you, Ken. Not at all. And yeah, I think if I recall, didn't they go like two, weren't they two hours into their walk in this mine? I mean, they were a long ways in yeah. there and this occurred. So talk about yeah. feeling just, yeah. I, I, I mean, darn near trapped, really. Right. Yeah. You're down that far and, and you've been exploring that long and I'd be afraid that I'd lose my way that would be my biggest fear right you know of getting lost down there because there's a lot of stories of people who have done that they've gone spelunking or something and and they just got lost and and never find their way back out or take some really long time so yeah 
for sure. And, and just the idea of running into that creature too is Ugh. just super spooky. Yeah, no, no thanks. That, that would freak me right out. Yeah, and I think at one point he said that his friend was faster than him because he was taller. So he kind of was getting left in yeah. the dust. And that, that's when you don't want to be the one that runs slower than your friend. Yeah, exactly. Yep. That's, it goes to that story of the two guys that run into the bear and the one starts putting his, 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 uh, hiking boots off and his running shoes on and his buddy's like, you can't outrun a bear. And he says, I just have to outrun you. I don't have to outrun right. a bear. That's the kind of same kind of thing. That's so that's right. Yeah. Ken's but, like, thanks, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks I'm a lot. Last in line. Uh -huh. Don't want to be last in line. Okay. Well, yep. last but not least, this one is titled Bait, shared by Mike. Yeah, so he contacted me too after reading one of my books, contacted me through uh, my website, and he had this really kind of weird story. So he he was in high school and you know he worked at this convenience store, and during the summertime, a lot of the high school kids would hang out at this kind of abandoned house on the outside of town that the bank had claimed and nobody had ever fixed it up. And so one night, um, his two buddies, Brian and Andy come and grab him after he's done with work and they go out to this, uh, this house and they build a bonfire or a little fire in the back. And they're just kind of hanging out. And, and all of a sudden one of them's like, Hey, you guys, can you guys hear that? And they listen and they can hear a woman crying in the forest. That's right behind the house. And so they, you know, grab their flashlights and they head out there to see, you know, if somebody's hurt, you know, something's going on. They start headed out into the forest together. The further they got into the forest, the sound got further and further away. By the time they were about 200 yards in and it's kind of thick, he, you know, they're like, um, Mike was like, this is really creepy guys. We got, let's, I, I want to go back. And so they decide, well, okay, we'll go back. So they start walking back. They realize as they're walking back, this sound is coming closer to them. You know, it's walking back with them. And after a while, it's almost caught up to them. And, you know, they stop and one of his friends turns around and yells, you know, are you okay? You know, are you hurt? And this woman's voice comes out and it says, you know, help me, please. And Mike, Mike was talking, you know, when I'm interviewing him, he's like, it sounded like a woman, but it, when it went, the sound just made me feel wrong inside. Like, like this wasn't right. Something was really bad. And, you know, so he's like, guys, we got to go. This isn't, you know, this isn't right. And so, but his buddy Andy's like, no, I'm going to check it out. And he starts walking back that way and he stops. And when he stops, he, you know, Mike realizes that Andy's just shaking. And so he walks over to where kind of where Andy is so he can see. And about 20 yards away from them, there's this creature that's poking its head around the tree. And it's just got a pale white head. The only distinguishing features were big black eyes and just a slit, you know, big slit for a mouth. They're just staring at this thing kind of in shock. And all of a sudden, you know, it gets this big, you know, its mouth starts opening in like this weird, creepy grin. And it's and a big pale hand comes around the tree. This is like straight out of a horror movie. So uh, Mike turns to run, runs into Brian. They go to the ground in a heap. Andy vaults over both of them, vaults over them and is headed for the house. They finally get, you know, Mike gets up, grabs it, Brian. They're just running as fast as they can. They finally catch up to Andy at the road. <laughs> Brian was so mad. He, he basically took a swing at Andy for leaving him. They were just, just, he was so angry about the whole situation. You know, they finally get calmed down and get home. And they talk about it. Obviously, they've all seen the exact same thing. And they just had no idea what in the world this could possibly be. They do feel like they did feel like uh, Mike said that, you know, he definitely felt like they were trying to be lured away into the forest for whatever reason. Um, and that this thing was mimicking the sound of a woman, which is also super creepy. 
But, you know, I kind of talked to him, Mike, too, about because he, he re- remembered one or two of my stories where different things mimic, you know, cousins or brothers or older family members to lure people away. And he thought, was that the kind, same kind of thing? And I couldn't give him an exact answer, but um, I said that he wasn't obviously alone in the fact that there's these entities that seem to try and draw people away into the forest or into an abandoned building. And whatever it was is something that he had a the unfortunate, you know, run in with. So it's definitely one of the creepier stories that I have. Yeah, when I was trying to picture this, because it's tough to picture anything without ears and a nose, right? I mean, that's just not, mm-hmm. you just, it's tough to see that. But then when you, you put that in your mind even a little bit, that is so freaky. I can't even begin to tell you much on the no list that is, especially just being out in the woods with that thing. And it, some of the description right. reminds me of episode 122. And for lack of a better term, she called it a Wendigo. But you can call it a crawler or, a you know, maybe it is a mimic, but, it you know, she wasn't out in the woods with it, which to her was probably a great thing. It was terrifying yeah. enough in her car, but it makes you wonder, you know, are these one and the same, the crawler entities, the mimics, because uh, maybe they just don't mimic all the time. Or, of course, if you're not around to hear it, you know, doesn't, if a tree falls in the wood, blah, 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 maybe you just can't. Right physically hear that thing doing the hey come out in the woods help me the help me please and a woman's cry is uh that's really horrifying to be honest with you it is yeah and and what i find is fascinating too is the fact that if you go through folk folklore and you know the native american folklore they have several creatures that they talk about luring children or luring people into the forest or luring them to the water or so it's not you know a new thing this has obviously been going on for a very long time but what it is exactly you know you just don't know and it's it's just really kind of on the scary side of the paranormal for sure yeah definitely on the no list uh before we get to your contact info and where to get the book of course let's give a little shout out to the illustrator and i'm assuming it's the same illustrator that you've been using right yes it is uh kate walker um it's uh, annie's niece and she does an amazing job she's very talented um it's it's fun to work with her for sure i just hope she doesn't get nightmares trying to, to draw some of these <laughs> things right Right, exactly. She's she says that she has to go back to to drawing some of her fun things in between yeah. for sure. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she does an awesome job. Uh-huh. So don't blame her on that uh-huh. one. Well, yeah, John. No. L- let everybody know where to find not only this book but of course all of your books and how to get in touch with you if someone has a story that they want to share. Yeah, so you can contact me at strangerbridgerland dot com. Um, all my contact is there or. OlsonJ243 at gmail.com. And you can find all of my books on Amazon. If you look up Stranger Bridgerland book series, the new one is, of course, uh, Stranger Paranormal. And all of my books are available on, as paperback or on Kindles, on the Kindle. And so there's a few on Audible. I'm hoping to get the rest eventually on Audible, but there's a few on there if uh, you happen to have an account with Audible as well. Like I said, uh, feel free, anybody, feel free to contact me and, and let me know on strangerbridgeland.com if you've got a story or if you just want to let me know how you like the books. I, I love just hearing from everybody. Well, and I think it's I, not that I've asked you ahead of time, but I'm just assuming because you are just, you're a story collector just like I am. I'm assuming that you get more stories, you're going to just going to be more books, right? Yeah. Yep. I still, I, I've even collected several now and I am in the tentative part of starting on the next book. There'll definitely be a next book. And like you say, I'll just keep going as long as I can. This is, it's just a lot of fun to hear from people and write the stories and it's, it's just all kinds of fun. Yeah. As long as it stays fun and people contact us, we will keep going. I feel the exact same way you do. As long as we still love it, then on we shall go. Yep. Exactly. Well, John, thank you so much for coming on, and I'm excited for part two because it was tough to to choose, but I'm going to have to whittle it down a whole lot because there's a lot of really good stories in, in uh, Stranger Paranormal, so everybody go pick that up right now. 
Well, thank you, John. Thanks so much, Shannon. And congratulations. The show is awesome and everything you're doing, you just do an amazing job and we all appreciate it.